Friday, it's 8.30. It's 8 I wear my seminar sweater. I'm delighted to welcome you. Uh, yet another fantastic seminars to be happening here. And I also want to mention uh, that we saw Trill here at, at the center. Uh, we're going to grow uh, by two additional faculty. So hopefully even will be a much more of the excitement coming from Irvine. So that, that you just guys know. Uh, today we have a great uh, veterinarian who works on um, eyes and the big dogs uh, play a critical role for developing Luxterna. And this was at the time when I met uh, Simon and uh, we, uh, he did a beautiful work uh, with one of the drugs that we had at that time uh, to rescue vision in, embryo, in blind dog with RP65. So um, really, uh, Simon, I'm delighted. I hope uh, your uh, favorite dog will be with you uh, today. And uh, from now on, let's just move on to uh, John Hong. Hello, it is uh, my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Simon Peter jo Peterson Jones. He got his doctorate in veterinary medicine and completed his clinical residency training at the University of London. He holds a diploma in veterinary ophthalmology from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. He became head of ophthalmology services at the Royal School of the Veterinary Sciences, Edinburgh University, before moving to Cambridge University as a Wellcome Trust Veterinary Career Development Fellow, where he completed his PhD investigating the molecular genetics of inherited canine retinopathy. He then moved to Michigan State University, where he split his time between clinical veterinary ophthalmology specialty practice, teaching, and research. His lab con concentrates on investigation of spontaneously occurring hereditary eye disease in dogs and cats, with emphasis on identification of causal gene mutations and development of genetic testing to allow the conditions to be eradicated from the pet population. He has established several colonies of translationally relevant dog and cat retinopathy models, allowing development of therapeutic approaches such as gene, drug, and cell therapy. Colonies include those that model fever congenital amaurosis, RP65, CRX, AIL, AIPL1, CEP290, retinitis pigmentosa, PD6, CNGB1, and retinopathy and other retinopathies involving RDH5, CABP4. He has since trained three PhD students who have went on to continue their careers contributing to research in veterinary ophthalmology. He has earned numerous grants, multiple R R24s, 44s, o O1s, as well as many foundational university and institutional funding. He serves as a consultant providing clinical and research services to biotech and biomedical companies, including Abbott and Pfizer. He has 121 publications and counting, along with numerous book chapters. He is co-editor of Small Animal Ophthalmology, one of the leading uh, journals and, uh, and uh, public, uh, editorials for uh, veterinary, uh, veterinary um, medicine and BSAVA, Manual of Small Animal Ophthalmology. He has given lectures all around the world. And without further ado, it is our honor to have Dr. Peterson Jones as our speaker today. Well, thanks for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, Chris and Philip, very many thanks for inviting me to this wonderful seminar uh, series. I feel very uh, honored to, uh, to be invited. Hopefully the, the screen is sharing with everybody and you can hear me uh, well. All good. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna do in the talk today is start off with a little bit of justification of why we use large animal models. Uh, Chris uh, very kindly mentioned RP65 work, which uh, I haven't included here, but um, that was a really good example of where the dog really helped uh, develop therapy that went on to uh, clinical uh, treatment. I'm going to give two examples of uh, gene augmentation work that we've done with uh, two of our uh, retinitis pigmentosa models, and then finally um, 
talk about a new CAP model that we've been working on, and that's uh, also been worked in collaboration uh, with UCI. Okay, so why are dog and cat models useful? So it's important to recognize that spontaneously occurring mutations occur in pet dogs and cats, and particularly recessive diseases have been uh, selected for by breeding practices. And often these conditions will mimic um, the comparable condition in humans. And we're able to establish some of these into colonies where we can understand disease process and also help develop translational therapies. So the dog and cat eye is similar in size to the human, and it has uh, retinal um, photoreceptor numbers that are also somewhat similar to human. So in this schematic at the bottom here, you can see a human eye, a dog or cat eye, they're both similar in size. And this is to scale, so you can see how similar they are to the human eye. And so any sort of interventions that you might want to do surgical treatments and so on, that uh, would be done on a human eye, you can replicate in the dog and uh, cat eye. And for comparison, obviously a mouse eye is much smaller, making some of these procedures more uh, difficult. What I think is particularly important is the presence of this high acuity uh, area, which is equivalent to the human uh, macula and is present in both dogs and cats. If we look at this heat map from some studies we did with uh, Freya Merck a while ago, this is looking at cone density in a dog flat mount. So it's a heat map and the scale here shows you the uh, density. The dot in the middle is the optic nerve head and the peak density you can see here is the area centralis that we call it in, in uh, animals, but that's the equivalent to, to the human macula. And you'll also notice there's a linear streak above the optic nerve head of increased uh, cone density, which is the visual streak. And we'll see that in the cat model that we talk about. So this is a dog, but the cat will be very similar. And it's not just cones that are densely packed in these regions, it's uh, rods that are also densely packed. And in the middle of the um, area centralis, we have uh, a region of peak cone density. And William Beltran in this study in 2014 quantified the number of cones in, in dogs and compared that to macaque, monkeys, and humans. And you can see this overlap in, in cone uh, density between the three uh, species. And um, this is very important, obviously, because the macula is a site for both high acuity vision, but also certain disease processes. So it really is useful to have an animal model that has equivalent of a macula. The introduction listed some of the um, models that we have at uh, MSU. And on this slide, I've listed some of the um, models where uh, those are in red, uh, have gene therapy reported in the literature. Those that are underlined are models that we uh, have at Michigan State Uni uh, University. So you can see we have Labor's congenital amaurosis model, including the RP65 dog, retinitis pigmentosa, and I'm going to talk about PD6A mutant dog work and CNGV1 mutant dog work. And there are many other ones that are described in the literature in the pet population that haven't been established into colonies, but if some of those are clinically relevant, they could be established into uh, colonies. Uh, quite excitingly, there's a Stargardt disease dog model that's been recognized by a group in uh, Sweden, and we're establishing a colony in Michigan State. Then I'm going to talk about the RDH5 mutant cat colony that we've been working on fairly recently, although it's a fairly prolonged project, as you'll hear about. And then we also have a CABP4 mutant dog which we have successful gene therapy for, but uh, hasn't been published uh, yet. So moving on to the first set of gene therapy results, this is in the CNGB1 um, mutant dog. The breed that we identified the mutation in is the Papillon here. Um, this is an example of the breed. And in humans, um, CNGB1 RP is predicted to be the sixth most prevalent recessive IRD by this study from Hannay. Uh, et al. looking at genome sequence data. And this uh, schematic just reminds us of the position of CNGB1, which is in the rod outer segment plasma membrane. 
where it's uh, one subunit for the cyclic nucleotide gated channel that is important as the um, end effector of uh, rod phototransduction. And so with phototransduction, the phosphodiesterase will hydrolyze cyclic GMP, leading to closure of this uh, channel. And CNGB is just one subunit. Um, it um, combines with three of the alpha-1 subunits to form the active channel. And this uh, structure was shown uh, recently in this publication in Nature, uh, Structural Molecular Biology, with the three CNGA1 subunits and this one CNGB1 subunit. And CNGB1's role is um, to modulate the uh, uh, channel and Although CNGA1 can form a channel on its own in vitro, um, it uh, doesn't have the normal dynamics of the um, in vivo channel. Some of this work has already been published in uh, JCI. So if we look at the human and dog uh, phenotypes, so it's a typical retinitis pigmentosa with bone spicule formation constricting visual fields, autofluorescence around, uh, the macula marking the degenerating surrounding photoreceptors. And in the dog, this is um, one of our early uh, dogs in the colony. This is the right eye and the left eye and different fundus uh, photographs as the dog aged. And you can notice that dogs have this shiny reflective structure, the tapetum. And this is very valuable for us as veterinary ophthalmologists because we can tell if the retina is thickened about the tapetum or retina is thinned about the tapetum just on the fundus view. The main changes you'll see in this is not only the color change in the tapetum, but the loss of uh, superficial retinal uh, blood vessels. So humans and dogs with uh, mutations in CNGB1 lack normal rod function, and so they're night blind from an early age. An important feature for um, future gene therapy studies or, or uh, treatments are that there's a slow rod degeneration. So although there's an early loss of uh, function, there's a slow loss of uh, structure. So that gives you a, a wide window of opportunity for gene augmentation uh, therapy approaches. And typical for RP with uh, rod degeneration, there's a secondary cone loss and eventually will lead to uh, legal blindness. So our initial therapy approach in the dog model was an AAV-based approach using an AAV5 serotype. We used the GRK1 promoter, which targets both rods and cones, although we only needed to target rods in this project. And then we used the canine CNGB1 um, cDNA. This is delivered by subretinal injection so that we deliver the AAV adjacent to the target cell, the rod photoreceptor. The fundus image at the bottom shows uh, a dog just immediately after it's had subretinal injections, and we've created two subretinal blebs, as you can see here, so increasing the surface area of our treatment. And four hours later, these are mostly resolved, and over the last, the next one or two days, they will completely resolve the detachment, and the retina will reattach. So we found this. Uh, Vector was capable of uh, restoring the cyclic nucleotide gated channels to the outer segment as shown on the immunohistochemistry here. The top panel, we're looking at CNGB1 um, immunolabeling and the bottom one, CNGA1, the fellow subunit. And you can see in our unaffected control dogs, the outer segments are labeled by CNGB1 and CNGA1. In our untreated CNGB1 mutant dog, there's no CNGB1. But also, there's very little CNGA1 that gets to the outer segment. And that's because the presence of CNGB1 is um, required for the normal trafficking of the um, um, subunits to the outer segment. Then we look at three eight, uh, time points post injection in three, nine, and 23 months post injection. And these dogs all have good uh, CNGB1 expression just in the treated area and also accompanying CNGA1. So we know that both subunits for the channel are present in the outer segments of treated dogs. And then this is an untreated dog at 28 months of age. And you can see that the DAPI staining for the outer nuclear layer here shows quite considerable thinning by this uh, age. And there's just a little bit of autofluorescence in the uh, RPE uh, showing up here. 
So looking at uh, function, um, I'm going to show you a series of ERGs here. So these are dark adapted ERGs designed to look at, at rod function predominantly. And we're starting with a dim flash of light shown by the top tracing and increasing the luminance of the flash till we get to a, a strong flash at the bottom here. And as we increase the luminance, the cones start to uh, become active. And the response that we see in the untreated um, CNGV1 mutant dog is mainly cone driven, but there is some desensitized rod components to that. Then the bottom panel looks at a rod flicker response, five hertz flicker, and you can see there's really little to see in the untreated eye. Then we have the same dog at three, 12 and 18 months post-treatment, and you can see good restoration of uh, ERG responses with very convincing rod responses and the rod flicker shows uh, the same as the luminance series here. And that's maintained over the duration that we uh, kept dogs. And the um, amplitudes of the um, ERG responses are proportional to the surface area of retina that we treat as you would expect as it's a summed response with a full field ERG. How does that rate relate into uh, functional um, vision? And so this is an obstacle course and we're looking at scotopic levels here. And the dog that's going through the course on the left here has uh, its untreated eye exposed, the left eye. We've treated the right eye, but it's covered with an opaque contact lens. So the dog is navigating by uh, vision under uh, um, the left eye under these scotopic conditions. And the obstacle course is actually in a straight line as shown in the schematic at the top uh, right of the image. So that dog is clearly not getting through the obstacle course particularly well. When we expose the right eye, the treated eye, you can see the difference. The dog is able to navigate in this dim light obstacle course pretty uh, rapidly, showing good restoration of rod mediated function. We look at the uh, structure of the treated retinal regions uh, with OCT here. We have a, a wild type unaffected dog here showing the different retinal layers. The outer nuclear layer is marked here. And then we have a series of bands which represent reflections from the ellipsoid zone in the, uh, in the middle here, the external limiting membrane at the edge of the outer nuclear layer, and then the interdigitation zone between the outer segments and the RPE. And then we have um, the same region looked at in a treated dog, which was injected at five months of age. And this is six, 12, 18, and 23 months post-injection. You can see good preservation of the retinal layers and definition of the region for the inner and outer segments. If we compare this with an untreated affected dog at 18 months of age, you can see the thinning of the outer nuclear layer uh, that occurs with disease progression. And in the bottom panel here, we're looking at OCT across a treatment bleb. So the area to the left of this um, CSLO image is the treated bleb. The area to the right is the untreated region. And you can see on the uh, OCT across that region with this magnified central um, junction here, the treated area on the left with good outer nuclear layer thickness and definition of these lines representing the inner outer segment region. And then after the um, junction between the untreated and treated, we see this untreated region with thinning of the outer nuclear layer and loss of definition of the outer retinal layers. And if we look at the immunohistochemistry across the same region with the photoreceptors pointing down to match the OCT, you can see with CNGB1 labeling, we've got nice expression in outer segments here, well-preserved outer nuclear layer, and then as we go into the untreated region, we um, see that the outer nuclear is starting to uh, thin and we see no CNGB1 uh, expression. So these uh, proof of concept works um, using a cDNA with a dog CNGB1 led us to an R24 um, project, which uh, the, the collaborative group here internationally is shown here with their different roles. And the strategy here is to develop a vector that could then be used in a human clinical trial. So for that, we, we stayed with the AAV serotype. 
We didn't want GRK1 as we'd used in the initial dog study because that could also lead to expression in cones and we weren't sure of the effect of that. So we wanted a dog specific promoter. So a new short rhodopsin promoter was developed. This is from Stylianus Makalakis's work. And this was a human short rhodopsin promoter. First of all, we looked to see if that would result in GFP expression in um, uh, animal species. And this is from a non-human primate showing a very specific rod mediated uh, transduction from this uh, promoter. Then when we put the uh, cDNA for the therapeutic gene, which this time was a human CNGB1, um, we showed mouse rescue, which was reported in this paper here. And the dog rescue is not yet uh, in the literature, but um, the rescue was as good as we saw with the original uh, dog um, construct. And so the human CNGB1 works pretty well in the dog as well uh, as the dog one, actually. And so we see the untreated ERGs here, six months post-treatment, and then the rod flicker at the bottom in this uh, scotopic uh, ERG series. So excited to have this... Uh, hopefully move to a, a, a clinical trial in the future in the next few years. And part of the um, study on the R24 is detailed patient natural history study. So we have endpoints that can be used for um, the uh, efficacy of a treatment uh, trial. Now I'm going to move breeds of dog to a more rapid disease. This is a PD6A mutation and the breed that we identified this in was a cardigan Welsh corgi and this work was part of my PhD studies back in Cambridge a long time ago. The current study that I'm going to talk about is um, in conjunction with the RD Cure consortium based in Germany and one of the aims of that consortium is to uh, develop uh, therapy for PD6A RP and then it's funded by this foundation. So the preliminary work is um, published in this journal, but we've been following out dogs and doing additional studies since then. So a little bit about uh, the background for PD6A uh, RP and dog disease in humans. It accounts for about three to 4% of recessive RP. It's a relatively severe phenotype and leads to childhood night blindness. And in the affected um, dogs, we they, they never have run, uh, functional rods and are night blind from the earliest age that we can test their vision. Humans get the restricted uh, visual fields and progressive to legal blindness, as you'd expect. And in dogs, we have a very rapid rod loss with a secondary cone death, and they're blind by one to two years uh, of age. And this is a fundus image from one of the um, affected dogs with a pretty degenerate retina. So the mutation is here, it's a frame shift mutation, and there's a lack of PD6A expression. And when there's no PD6A, PD6B, the other active subunit is not uh, um, shipped to the outer segment. So we have no phosphodiesterase present, and this leads to a failure in phototransduction, accumulation of cyclic GMP, which the PDA would normally uh, break down, and that's toxic to the cell, leading to this rapid rod and then cone uh, death. So if we look at PD6 activity, this is um, in red, the affected dogs against age compared to control wild type dogs. And you can see um, there's really very little detectable activity. If we look at the rod ERGs, these are a little bit different. They're an illuminance series as I showed before, but we've increased the magnification of the first few um, flashes here so you can see the waveform um, so we have a, a 50 uh, microvolt uh, for this bar here and 100 microvolts here and for the effect we've magnified things up this is 20 microvolts and the responses that we see here are just cone responses and the cones uh, have a normal b wave initially but uh, a slightly truncated a wave because they have shortened outer segments very early in the disease process. But these cones will die. And uh, as they're dying, they accumulate uh, uh, cyclic GMP as shown in this immunohistochemistry. So this is the outer nuclear layer, which is very thin to this age. And you can see um, this 
uh, accumulation of cyclic GMP, which you wouldn't see at all in a, a wild type uh, dog, you wouldn't detect anything. Looking at the histology, uh, control panel on the left, uh, column affected on the right, and already at four weeks of age, which is before or about the time of normal retinal maturation, we've got very stunted outer segments, we've got uh, some um, apoptotic looking nuclei, and as we go through seven and nine weeks, you can see the uh, degeneration of uh, rod nuclei. And the row that's left is predominantly cones, and we have this sort of dilation of the cone in the segments that uh, we see typically with uh, rod loss in a number of uh, diseases. So the gene augmentation um, approach we used, because it's a severe disease, we started treating at four weeks of age. So before there's too much loss of photoreceptors, and you can see at the bottom, this is a subretinal injection occurring in uh, one of our puppies. And the color of the uh, fundus here is that kind of violet color because the tapetum at this age has not yet uh, developed. The construct, we use an AAV8, which is a uh, stronger, more rapid uh, turn on. It um, was the uh, therapeutic construct for the RDQ consortium, it has a human rhodopsin promoter and the human PD6A and a couple of other elements to uh, improve the transduction. And so we found that um, if we looked at the rod ERG four months post injection, in the treated eye, we've got nice restoration of rod responses very convincingly and the rod flicker as shown before. Um, it's important to, to recognize that this is, the amplitudes of these responses are not the same as a wild type dog, but we're not treating the entire retinal area with the injection. And also um, some of the, the photoreceptor nuclei are already dead at this uh, uh, age that we injected. So we wanted to know whether this treatment was maintained in the long term. And we've kept a couple of dogs um, up to now, we're just approaching five years post injection and they'll have their outcome measures uh, assessed um, next month. But up to the 48 month time point, we have very good restoration of, or good maintenance of the restored uh, rod function. So we'll just show how this relates to um, vision. I'll try to, this uh, video is stalled for some reason or other, but we have uh, the scotopic lighting again, and maybe the dog's gonna go, whoops. We saw the part, first part of the, the video where the dog bumped into something. And if the video will play, you'll see that the dog has a lot of difficulty getting through this obstacle course under rod uh, vision with the untreated eye. Let's hope the treated eye works. And you have to take my word for it, but the dog uh, gets through that obstacle course without bumping into things and a lot more, a lot faster than um, the untreated uh, eye. I'll just try once more, see if I can get that video to play. Okay. So if we look at the immunohistochemistry in the treated and untreated retinal regions. These are, these are orientated, as you can see, with the photoreceptors pointing up. If we look at PD6A in our treated area, we've got good expression of the human PD6A in the dog uh, outer segments, nothing to detect in the untreated. And in the treated region, we've reversed this accumulation of cyclic GMP that occurs, which is still present in the untreated region. And then if we look at the subunit, for um, the phosphodiesterase, the other active subunit, the beta subunit, that's present in the treated region and not in the untreated region. And then next one down, we're looking at GFAP for upregulation of Muller glia, which is very upregulated in the untreated uh, region as gliosis starts to occur. And um, really, this is the same as you'd see in a wild type uh, dog with some labeling of the inner retina. If we look at cones, you can see with uh, PNA lectin looking at the uh, cone sheaths, we've got uh, good morphology of the cones in the treated region, poor in the untreated region, and then the double labeling with uh, 
a combination of the current opsin antibodies uh, is shown beneath. So we've got uh, nice looking rods and nice looking cones in the treated region. This is just a merged uh, image of, of, uh, of uh, low power across the treated bleb with treated at the left here. And it's uh, also labeled for cyclic GMP. So you can see lack of cyclic GMP in the treated region and then cyclic GMP accumulation in the untreated uh, region. Now it's important to investigate whether therapy can keep cones alive because obviously cones are most important for our vision. And if we look at the cone ERGs, this is a light adapted ERG, so cone only responses starting with a luminance series, a small luminance series for cones. And you can see in the treated eye, we've got nice looking cone responses and that's maintained up to the 48 month time point. Cone responses die in untreated eyes over the first year and are completely absent from two years on. And this at four years post-treatment in the contralateral eye, the untreated eye has a flat line response. And then at the bottom we have cone flicker responses. And then I put um, um, images of um, immunohistochemistry with HCAR for labeling the full length of the uh, cones in the treated region. Again, the morphology looks nice. In the untreated region, the morphology of the cones is not uh, well preserved. So hopefully this video is going to run. So we look at the uh, light adapted vision, so the, the cone only uh, vision. And so um, this is with the untreated eye. This is two years post injection for this dog. And you can see the dog is bumping into obstacles, kind of feeling um, his way through, will eventually get through to the other edge of, end of the obstacle course. And then if we look at the um, treated eye, you can see the dog gets through that obstacle course extremely uh, rapidly. So um, uh, by two years of age, the untreated eye has lost vision, and yet the treated eye still has very good vision, which is now present up to four years post-treatment. Looking at retinal preservation, um, on the OCT image across the edge of a treatment bleb, you can see the treated region looks, looks great. The untreated region is very degenerate. And we can quantify this. This is study only went up to the um, two year time point, but we have data up to four years now. And the treated eye in blue here has well preserved retinal thickness. This is total retinal thickness, whereas the control is, uh, is thinning as it degenerates. And we can look at the different retinal layers. There's not uh, a lot of difference in the inner retina, but the outer retina, the outer nuclear layer, and then the receptor plus, uh, which is measuring the full length of the uh, photoreceptors, uh, both shows very good uh, preservation in our matched uh, treated area. There's an initial decline, which occurs um, in the period after injection. And I think some of that is because um, some rods are probably too far on the process of apoptosis to be saved, and we may not tra uh, transduce all of the uh, photoreceptors in the, in the treated area. But once um, that's over, we have a good plateau of uh, thickness. This uh, slide shows the number of fundus images of one treated eye. This is two years post-treatment. Here's the uh, injected region here, just dorsal to the optic nerve head. And this looks ophthalmoscopically in good shape, looks like normal retina, good vasculature. If we move outside it, the surrounding area looks extremely degenerate and you can see very little vasculature. The same appearance on the um, CSLO image here with the uh, IR imaging. And then if we look at fluorescein angiography to show up the blood vessels, you can see a good preservation within the region, outside of the treated region. Um, the retina is very degenerate and the vasculature is declined. And this is another dog looking at the same sort of thing with fluorescein angiography shown underneath here, color image at the top here with well uh, conserved this region. This is the retinotomy site here. And then if we look at um, OCT angiography, we can get nice definition of the individual vascular layers in the uh, retina and choroid in the treated region that looks really in good shape and outside of the treated region, it's uh, 
pretty poor with um, the main vessels that are showing are those which feed back into the treated region. So those are well maintained. Those that uh, feed into this region only are uh, lost. So we have um, good rescue of rod function. And I hope to be able to say this is to at least five years after we do our outcome measures next month. And uh, good maintenance of cone function, improved inner segment, outer segment morphology and retinal structure. And the treated um, regions keep good vascular supply. Now, obviously this is a therapy that's done at an early disease stage. And when this moves to human patients, they're unlikely to be caught when they're kids to be treated and uh, they're gonna be treated at later disease stages. So we're looking at that in the dog at the moment. And we um, have identified a demarcation between where we can successfully rescue ERG and uh, function and where um, the retina is too thinned and too degenerate to be able to rescue. So this is gonna be important uh, information that we're teasing out at the moment. Um, but uh, one interesting feature is that um, we can have dogs with restored visual function through the obstacle course, um, yet we can't record a, a rod ERG on them. So there shows that um, you don't need a massive number of functional um, rod photoreceptors to get through an obstacle course um, if you're a dog. I'm going to finish off now talking about our new CAT model. Um, this is a, has a mutation in the RDH5 gene, and we um, published the preliminary work on this at the end of um, uh, last year. And this is our founder CAT, a CAT we called Sheen, and uh, I identified him about uh, 12 years ago, and we've been studying this disease since then, so it's been a fairly long process. Um, the thing that struck me about this cat's retinas are these two fundus images that we can see on the right eye and the left eye. And for reference, we've got a normal cat fundus up in the top right of the slide. So what I noticed was this dull appearance across the area centralis and visual streak. And as I mentioned, the tapetum um, allows you to judge the thickness of the retina which overlies it. So this tells me that the retina is thickened in this region. So this is quite uh, an abnormal appearance in a, in a cat and it's bilaterally symmetrical. So we kept him, we bred from him and we followed the progression of his lesions. And so we can see by 36 months of age, it looks a little different. We can see some lightning in the middle of the area centralis of this left eye. And this actually ophthalmoscopically looks like retinal thinning. This has increased um, by 54 months of age. And Sheen is still uh, with us now and he's still uh, breeding. And we created a, a colony. This is a pedigree, a part of the colony. And we took three cats from this colony, um, an obligate heterozygote, so a carrier, uh, a litter mate that was affected, a homozygote, and another animal from another litter that was a homozygote affected. Uh, after whole genome sequencing, we um, did subtractions to identify variants that were private, private to the trio and not in um, um, the genomes of 129 uh, other reference cats, which were part of an initiative called the 99 Lives initiative to initially sequence 99 cat genomes, but it's now well into the 200 uh, cat genomes. And the only variant that we found in a gene that was um, relevant for the retina was in RDH5. This was the only one that segregated in our colony, and it's a uh, glycine 181 uh, valine missense. And this glycine is um, fairly well conserved across species. And this is a, a model that um, uh, Philips uh, lab generated for us. This shows the um, glycine 181 at the interface between the dimer of uh, RDH5, as RDH5 is thought to exist in, in, a, in a dimer. And this is a, um, just a reminder of the position of RDH5 in the uh, visual cycle within the RPE. So it's important for the conversion of 11 cis retinol to 11 cis retinal uh, for shipping back to the photoreceptors for regeneration of the visual pigments. 
And without RGH5, it's already known that uh, slow regeneration of 11 cis retinal can occur. So there are presumably other players involved in this uh, process. But um, without normal RDH5, the process is very uh, delayed. So we confirmed that, uh, or looked at the presence of RDH5 in the affected cat retina. On the Western plot, uh, this is our um, homozygous affected cat with no RDH5 to be seen. Um, the heterozygous has um, a smaller amount of RDH5 than the wild type control. And on the immunohistochemistry with an RDH5 antibody, nothing was detected in the RPE of the affected cat, but its presence in the RPE of wild type cats. And then in this uh, in vitro functional assay from um, uh, Anahita in uh, Philip's lab, we're looking at uh, both the wild type normal cat uh, RDH5 and the effect of the mutant RDH5, the G181 failing um, mutation. So the solid line here um, in this assay involves feeding 11 cis retinal and uh, having it converted in the, into 11 cis retinol, which is obviously the opposite way to the enzymatic reaction we're looking for in the RPE, but obviously the enzyme can work in both directions. And we can see that there's really no, nothing at all produced by the uh, uh, mutant uh, protein. So even if it was expressed in vivo, we would expect it to, to have no function. So let's quickly look at the um, phenotypes of human RDH5 retinopathies, and uh, we'll go on to compare that, the CAP model. So it, in humans, it results in a congenital night blindness, and the patients will recover rod function with prolonged dark adaptation. There's evidence in many patients of cone dysfunction as well. And some patients will develop a macular degeneration, particularly as they get older. And AO imaging, which is being more widely used in these patients also so shows early cone abnormal abnormalities before uh, macular abnormalities can be detected grossly. And so in our recent paper, this is one of the human subjects. This is um, from Omar Maru, Maru from Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. And this patient's homozygous for this missense mutation. And you can see um, the macula is um, involved in both eyes here. So quite obvious macular degeneration. And in the white angle um, color fundus images, we, we see the same thing. You might notice there's some little specks out in the uh, periphery outside of the macula. This is shown better in this uh, fundus image um, that I used here. So most of the patients with the RDH5 mutations will develop these white spots. And that uh, has led to the descriptive term fundus albipunctatus uh, for the uh, condition. But not all patients to develop it and it's uh, quite uh, variable. So let's see how the cat uh, shapes up to the, the human. Um, this is a protocol to look at the recovery of dark adaptation, so an ERG protocol. Um, we dark adapted the animal overnight and uh, recorded a rod ERG. And this is um, at the luminance for the ICEF standard for rod ERGs, 0.01 candela seconds per meter squared. You can see we've got a nice looking ERG in the wild type cat. We then expose the cat to a rod suppressing background light. This is the same light that will be used if you are wanting to go on to record photopic or cone ERG. So 10 minutes of a 30 candela uh, per meter square background light. We then switch the light off and look to the recovery of rod responses. After four minutes, there's a little bit of a response increased by 24 and almost back to the effect of uh, uh, amplitude of uh, overnight dark adaptation. Now looking at the Mutant cat in the same protocol, four minutes is a little blip there, hasn't changed by 24 minutes and 60 minutes, it still hasn't started to increase. So there's very prolonged and abnormal um, rod recovery in the mutant cat, which is different from um, a previous mouse uh, knockout model that was uh, uh, developed and looked at. We then developed this uh, protocol to look at cone recovery using um, ERG. So this is a 
uh, not a very conventional protocol, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. So what we did first of all in the light adapter die with the 30 candela meter squared background light is to present um, a series of 10 flashes at 7.2 candela seconds per meter squared. These are the red bars here and we average these to record our uh, Cone ERG. Black is wild type and red is affected cat. We then present the cat with these four very strong uh, flashes of a thousand candela seconds per meter squared. Repeat the uh, Cone ERG here with the 10 averaged. Do that again. And this is repeated 25 times till we come to the end of the protocol. By the end of the protocol, you can see here on this um, um, black wild type is still maintained, whereas the RDH5 ERG is decreased. Then if we look at the individual uh, flashes across the protocol, so this is the um, average flash from each uh, set of the 7.2 candela seconds per meter squared. You can see the wild type, the um, flashes look, responses look pretty similar across the length of the protocol, whereas in the mutant cat, there's very obvious decline in uh, amplitudes as we expose the cat to more and more of these bright uh, lights, showing that we're suppressing the um, retinoid regeneration in cones. Now, what do the um, different fundus appearances that I showed uh, represent? So here's a fundus image. We've got this um, gray hyper-reflective streak across the visual streak. We've got the area centralis looking bright, telling me that there's thinning here. And if we look in the dorsal retina, we've got a very nice morphology here, nice looking outer segments. Everything looks good. If we look in the area centralis, it's very thin. The outer nuclear layer is lost to a, a single layer of nuclei and lost outer segments here. So this is clear retinal degeneration here. And then in the visual streak region, the dull region, the retina is actually thickened. So we, the outer segments are lengthened and they're actually distorted uh, in this region. And the nice sharp demarcation between inner segments and out, outer segments is somewhat lost across this region as well. So if you look at the EM um, images here, um, you can see again, we've got nicely uh, organized rod outer segments initially, and then everything goes to pieces as we reach the distal end. So there's distortion of the distal end. There's um, accumulation of material within the um, rod outer segments, as you can see here and shown uh, clearly here. We see numerous of these. So it looks like the photoreceptor um, tips are not being phagocytosed normally. And the RPE has changes as well with this um, kind of almost uh, baculated kind of appearance, which is quite abnormal compared to uh, wild type uh, ERG. So we're uh, RPE, sorry. So we're really now trying to investigate what these RPE changes mean. And um, we also, as in people in the colony, see a, a variability in the macular degeneration just shown here. This is a wild type cat for reference. And this is a two year old affected cat, has um, reduced dark adaptation recovery but the area centralis looks quite normal as confirmed by the OCT. And then the, here's another um, cat where there's big degeneration. So we believe that there may be modifying gene loci that are uh, having either a protective effect, effect on the macula or um, are leading to degeneration. So let's just quickly compare the humans with the RDH5 mouse model and the RDH5 cat. So humans have slowed rod recovery, alter cone function, variable macular phenotype, retina spot formation. The mouse doesn't have any of those features really, unless you really prolong light exposure. Uh, the cat uh, ticks the first three, but we don't see retinal spot formation. So to finish off with our future studies, we want to try and understand this apparent failure of phagocytosis, which leads to retinal degeneration in the macula. We want to look at potential modifying gene loci, and look at translational therapy approaches to try and rescue the phenotype. So I'm going to finish there. I um, want to acknowledge um, people that uh, in my lab um, who are present currently and have the bottom few have uh, moved on um, that have been involved in this work. So Lawrence Asselli has been involved in all these projects and she started as a research intern, became a PhD student, then 
did a residency in ophthalmology and now is now part-time postdoc with us. And Paige is a, a postdoc who did a PhD on the CMGB1 project initially with me, went away, loved the weather in East Lansing so much, he came back again and is my chief uh, postdoc and various other lab members. The CNGB1 uh, consortium that I've already mentioned, uh, PDE6A studies, um, Stylianus has been involved uh, as a collaboration with those. Uh, Steve Pickler did the um, PDE6 activity. And then uh, importantly for the RDH5 studies, great collaboration uh, with UCI. Uh, Anna Heat has uh, done a lot of uh, good analysis on the CAT samples that we've sent um, in Philip's lab. And Chris has been um, really wonderful to collaborate with. It's been a great honor to work with him over the last uh, five years of this uh, R24 that he is uh, uh, successfully coming to an end. And then um, the foundation for PD6A work and the Myers Dunlop uh, endowment that funds my position and allows us to do a lot of preliminary work before we um, um, establish uh, dog uh, colonies or cat colonies. So I'm gonna finish there and uh, be happy to answer any questions that uh, people might uh, have on this work. Hey, Simon, thank you so much. This was truly really wonderful. Oh, one thing before I have questions, Chris, do you recognize this dog here? Oh, yes. So this is- That's Gordon. from our paper, right? Yeah. So, um, so this is my dog. And every time we had Zoom meetings when we were at home during the pandemic, uh, Gordon would leap onto my lap and be involved in, in the um, uh, Zoom conference. And he, he struck up a, a very personal relationship with Chris during these times. I won't say any more about that relationship. <laughs> but what happened to him? He didn't join us the seminars. Is he bored with your talks or something? No, he's at home. I'm in my office at work. and uh, Somebody has to work, right? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you, Simon, so much. If you have any question, please drop me a note uh, through chat and uh, we will go uh, with question to Simon. Uh, so all open for you guys. I, I think there is a really a great opportunity, Simon, to work on that using gene editing uh, rather than gene augmentation. Uh, are you thinking to pursuing that? Yes, I would really like to um, develop collaborations and uh, look at the particular mutations that we have across the colony animals to see which would be um, most suitable for things like CRISPR editing. Um, I'm very keen to, um, to um, pursue that in the future, yeah. All right, R Rafael. Thank you, Dr. Peterson Jones, for the wonderful talk. I really liked it. Uh, it was really fascinating. I have a, I think, technical question because uh, it's really convenient to have a area of treated and untreated retina. But uh, is it possible to cover all the retina when we treat our patient? Thank you for your answer. Um, that's a really good uh, point. Uh, if you look at the RP65 human clinical trials, I think the tendency has been to go to look at retinal areas where there are still existing photoreceptors that could be um, uh, targeted. So I think the only time you would probably really want to aim for the entire retinal area would be if you're treating very early in the disease uh, process. And you can do that a, a couple of different ways. You can um, certainly create multiple retinal uh, detachments, but every time you do a retinotomy, you cause a little area of damage, and you may have difficulty getting the retinas to reattach if you if you have too many of these areas. Uh, so that's one approach. And then there's a lot of work uh, being done to develop viral vectors that are penetrating from the vitreous. Um, we've looked at some of these for our own studies and for other people, and. In the large animal models, we do see some penetration, but it's not uh, yet to a level that we it would be therapeutic. And also there's a, a big issue with uh, potential immune responses because um, putting um, vector into the vitreous, you're getting it resorbed or absorbed into the circulation, getting much more of an immune response. And so that's been an issue after we've treated dogs, whereas with the subretinal injection, 
immune responses, um, I'm sure they are, are present, but they're not uh, um, generally causing an inflammatory action uh, within the retina. So I think um, in the future, we would hope that um, large retinal areas can be treated effectively and uh, safely in, in human patients, but I don't think we're quite to that stage yet. So uh, before we go to Philip's question, really this intra vitro uh, injection is uh, not as sweet as it appears to be at first, right? That, that, that this immune response is a one problem, the other, the uh, penetration. Did you quantify that in any way? Uh, how many cells get infected? And... Yeah, so we have a couple of um, publications um, on that using a number of um, of uh, different um, AAV serotypes, different constructs. And what was quite interesting is it's um, good penetration amongst blood vessel, which, is, which has been reported in primates um, as well. But we saw a, a regional difference in penetration and um, there's much more penetration. I believe it was the um, more nasal retinal regions rather than the temporal retinal regions. And we weren't sure why. We've, we've looked at the um, internal limiting membrane um, and we can't see any particular difference between those retinal regions. But I have noticed in some of the presentations looking at primates that they seem to show the same regional uh, difference. So I'm not sure that people have made a big, big point of that in certainly in the presentations that, that I've seen. So we did quantify it and the numbers, the photoreceptors are that are transduced are, are far fewer than we, we would want uh, therapeutically. And we, we have looked at Avitrectomy um, and then injection two weeks later really reduced the um, transduction of the outer retina. And I think that's because the vector is cleared very rapidly from the vitreous when it's when there's no vitreous gel there. Um, that would be my hypothesis. And that was different from a, a finding from Fabine Rowling's group when they injected the vector straight after a vitrectomy, they found increased, increased um, transduction. And I think part of that may be some changes to the inner limiting membrane from the vitrectomy as you detach the vitreal face from the uh, face of the retina, you're probably having some mechanical effects. And I suggest, would, would imagine that our dogs have recovered from that effect uh, when we injected them a couple of weeks after the vitrectomy. So let me follow on that one more uh, quick uh, comment or question or discussion here. Uh, so um, when you take disease retina, again, Paul Sieving shows that it's much better penetration of the virus because you have drop out of the cells in the retina. So this transduction, transfection of, of the cells is much better uh, in this case. There are very few studies that really go into comparison to the wild type. And so the, the reason why this would be important to show in wild type, because you wanted to do it before really any degeneration. So that transduction is not going to be as good as when you're looking at the end of the disease. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I think some of it will depend on the disease process that you're, you're looking at um, as to the effects on, um, on uh, penetration. But certainly if you, if you dreamt up an ideal treatment, um, you would want to treat prior to loss of photoreceptors and by some easy to do route. And so the intravitreal approach certainly would uh, make it a much easier just in the office type uh, procedure rather than needing a, a vitreo retinal surgeon to, um, to treat. So hopefully future studies will um, smooth the way towards that sort of approach. But I think um, from what we've looked at in, in dog studies and what I've seen in the literature, we are a little ways from getting to that optimal position yet. So before we go to Philip, maybe a follow-up question from Corinne. Uh, yes, amazing, amazing results and amazing presentation. My quick question is a follow-up on the immune response. 
Uh, were you able to resolve it? I mean, if we think risk to advantage of doing a, a vitreal injection versus a subretinal, if, if we can manage the immune response, uh, is it worth it? And how quickly could we manage it? So for our studies, um, we used um, steroids at a um, immunosuppressive dose to try and control it. And we were not able to control that immune response. And um, we ended up um, finishing the study earlier than we had planned because of um, the amount of inflammation that was present in eyes. It's really quite, um, it can be quite marked. At least it was in our, in our studies. Um, we haven't tried more severe sort of immunosuppression, for example, using um, systemic uh, drugs such as cyclosporine. That might be a, be a route, but again, it wouldn't be optimal to be immunosuppressing the patients to that, that degree that you would with, say, transplant uh, patients. So I think um, studies to look at the, uh, what's causing the immune response and perhaps modifying uh, and I know this work is, is, is going on at the moment, but to modify the uh, vector capsids, um, to look at pre-existing exposure to AAVs, all these are sort of approaches um, um, are needed, I think, um, right. before we're to that stage that we can uh, safely use it in, in patients. Great, thank you. Sorry, Philip, to keep you waiting, Phil. No problem. Simon, uh, great, great talk. And thanks again for accepting the invitation. So I have kind of, this is probably a pretty naive question about veterinary medicine in general. So have you been able to apply any of these gene therapies to any, any of your animal patients? And it, I mean, is that something that you could do at this point? Or like, do you, would, would really you require like some regulatory approval in order to use this on a, on a general, you know, person bringing in their dog? Uh, that has, you know, this a particular mutation for which you have the gene therapy developed? Yeah, so the main uh, veterinary approach, once we identify these genes, is to have genetic uh, testing. And obviously you can control um, dog and cat breeding more than you can control human breeding. Um, so we can um, have breeders eradicate these con conditions very rapidly from the gene pool. So that's probably our, our most useful veterinary contribution. Um, when we were doing the RP65 work with Robin Alley, um, we rehoned some of our colony dogs and I wanted to treat them um, before they were pet, but the uh, company was not uh, willing to allow that. Um, in theory, we would be able to treat with the, the, the ones we've been working on most recently, CNGB1 and um, PD6A. Once we found the CNGB1 mutation, we had a pretty um, intensive uh, screening uh, session, which we then, um, um, so we, we, we rarely, if ever, see a CNGB1 affected uh, uh, dog now. And PD6A, we've known the mutation for 22 years. And so um, that's been bred out of the, uh, out of the corgi population as well. So theoretically, we could get approval to use the vector if it's um, one that we have as a, a research or which is, is up to, for dogs, has to be up to clinical grade, um, as long as it wasn't produced by a company. Um, there are various steps that we have, would have to go through for informed consent. But what I'm really hoping for with the, with the approach is that we have a vector that is really efficient uh, targeting dogs photoreceptors and then there's a more generic treatment that comes up that could be used across all sorts of retinal degenerations or photoreceptor degenerations in 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 dogs and then there would be a market uh, um, in our hospital to 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 treat uh, dog patients as well all right uh, we had a wonderful uh, conversation before we go to don zach final comments and questions we will go to vladimir thank you simon great to see you and thank you for the beautiful talk uh, yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> uh quick question uh, do you have any thoughts of the difference in phenotype between the rdh5 uh, mice and cats 
Um, well, the only thoughts that I have is that the cat's a good model, the mouse is a lousy model. Uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm kind of biased, uh, I would guess. Really? Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I really don't know the reason the species for for these species uh, uh, differences. I just assume that whatever is regenerating 11 cis retinal uh, slowly can do it more rapidly. It's not RDH5, can do it more rapidly in the mouse than, than uh, in the cat and, and, and human. Um, but I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to find out. And hopefully with future studies using the, the cats and comparing with the mice, it might be something that we can, uh, can investigate and, uh, and, and solve. I don't know if you have any um, well, thoughts you felt. Are the enzymes similar in, in uh, maybe Philip can chime in on that. Are the enzymes, the cat and, and a mouse enzymes similar in efficiency and structure? I mean, I, the only thing I'll say about this, I mean, this is Chris's work is, you know, that the RDH activity in mice in general tends to be much more robust compared to a lot of other species for whatever reason. So I don't know if they just have some, you know, enzymatic redundancy better enzymatic redundancy so that you can have other like rdh10 for example taking the place of rdh5 but uh yeah that's pretty well established from other from from akiko maeda and chris's work on different rdhs that's very robust in mice compared to other species all right let's go to our favorite don zack and the only one <laughs> Actually, I'm not the only one. There is another Don Zach in Baltimore. We've had mail uh, interchange by mistake, but uh, and he plays bagpipes. So, but I haven't met him yet. But he's not um, as beautiful as you are. Well, some people might disagree, Chris. But anyway, uh, hi Simon. As everyone said, it was a great talk. So thanks so much. I, I wanted to go back to the earlier issue you were discussing about different routes of administration, pluses and minuses. Have you guys tried superchoroidal? And if so, what has your experience been with that? Um, we have not tried the superchoroidal. Uh, I have my doubts about it. I, I've seen a number of um, papers where that route has been attempted in rodents. And uh, on them, you see a little area of subretinal detachment. So I'm not sure how much remains in the superchoroidal space. One thing I will say is, Occasionally in our uh, injections, which are transvitreal, transretinal, if you push the cannula a little too hard, you inject into the choroidal um, and perhaps suprachoroidal uh, region. And when you do that, you see a, a flash of change of color of the tapetum as the vector distributes very rapidly. And um, None of those animals, unless we've also got a subretinal bleb, have we seen any uh, functional rescue in. So I know that's not a, a direct assessment of suprachoroidal injection, mm -hmm. and that seems to be a, a fairly in vogue uh, route to be investigating. Um, but I just have my doubts that the vector gets across the barriers necessary to, to reach effectively to the uh, uh, photoreceptors that it gets through the tight junctions for the RPE and, and, and so on. So, um, so to answer it, I, I'm just making a lot of conjecture based on uh, not true experimental evidence, um, but just from our, our sort of anecdotal um, missed injections, if you like, in, in dogs. So, so, Don, can you comment on that intravitreal uh, injections and future in this direction? What are your thoughts? Like, really? Well, I mean, we, we don't directly study that or have done it, so it's just repeating what other people have said. But, you know, from some of the ongoing clinical trials and stuff, it seems like the, uh, you know, it's funny because I remember discussions with Gene Bennett, you know, whatever, dec a decade plus ago when people first injected AAV, there was no inflammation and everything was perfect. And now the more you look, the more you see. So I, I, I share the concerns, but I don't have any, you know, additional insights to offer. I, I think some of the new uh, serotypes and modifications and uh, directed evolution will hopefully find um, 
viruses that are less toxic. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, and primarily to Simon for yes. spending time I with did. us. And it's a wonderful work done. If uh, if you, Simon, could stay a little bit and, and also some do. Thanks for the invitation, Chris. It's been a real honor to be involved. Bye-bye. Another Thank quick you. question, Simon. What's the availability of these dogs to like research facilities or somebody who would like to do some more with that? Um, so we are always open for, for collaborations, actively encouraging collaborations. I mean, my philosophy for the, uh, you know, the large animals there, very expensive and, and, and valuable. And the numbers that you can produce are obviously nothing like you could do with mice. So I'd be particularly keen that there's not as the initial investigation, uh, unless the model's unique, but uh, would be where there's really good uh, evidence of that approach in other, other species or, or other, other ways. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm very keen to sort of discuss sort of future collaborations and projects with people. All right. Thank you. Sorry, my phone is ringing here. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So Simon, uh, maybe we should take a look on the sequences of the point mutations that you have in some of your colonies and, and that those that you have active whether they will be amenable to uh, gene editing by uh, base editors? Yeah, that would be great. Um, what I can do is I, I can put together um, a list of the different uh, mutations and genes. We will um, need a DNA sequence around the point of mutations. Yep. So, so some, um, some, where are you, Sam? I don't see you, buddy. Hello, I'm here. Yeah, maybe some is worth to take a look and, and stay in contact with Simon. Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, we're currently working on different delivery modalities for base editors. Um, and I think that doing some large animal models could be really valuable <clears throat> in doing some of these uh, pilot and proof of concept studies. And the second question, Simon, I have, um, I don't know whether it would be possible, but uh, maybe a, a, on the level of sperm, uh, the progenitor sperm of the dog, uh, that this modification could be done for gene editing. I don't see, see why not. I mean... Um... Are you familiar with uh, how to culture uh, sperms and that they can be re-injected and all of those things? No, but um, you know the, the technique for um, uh, AI is well established in, in dogs. We use that in the in the colony. We, you know, collecting semen samples and um, knowing the um, substances to keep them in is, is well established. It's we we don't here go beyond um, we we free semen. Um, for um, keeping colony going in the long term, um, so that's all is all established and um, insemination of artificial of frozen semen works well. We've we've imported semen from Europe, frozen and established uh, breeding animals from that. So that's part of it's fine. But what I'm not sure about is so we can keep keep semen alive, but I really don't know about culturing for longer term that you might need for for this sort of work so maybe um, you you wanted to take a look into that simon because that would be a phenomenal approach yeah so um what i'd need to know is how long would you would we ship semen chills uh, or would we do the the editing here um, on the fresh semen and how long they need to be incubated and and, and, I think maybe a day or two, that should be enough. And, and what's the proportion of, of sperm that you can edit? Well, that depends on the delivery system that needs to be tested, and perhaps by 
uh, sequencing that if we can get a you know high um, fraction of editing because the, of course you don't want it to breed them uh, when you have one percent right that that yeah. can happen but I, I think that um, the chances of going to the, that uh, could be as high as ninety percent. Look at our very recent cell paper. Okay just published a week ago. I, I can spell you my last name so you can find it. I've almost learned how to spell it. Almost. Uh, is that good enough? Almost? Well, it's a question of how many Z's and W's and... Oh, you just throw them randomly. <laughs> Why not you just uh, think about this a bit more and maybe you wanted to change what is not, uh, check what is known and and look at that paper by uh, by this non-viral delivery. Uh, yeah, we have a, a local dog reproduction specialist. I can ask about his experiences of culturing and so on. So, um, although I don't have that expertise, I can obviously find that out. Yeah, so, so Sam, Sam will contact you, Simon. I will put you together by email. Uh, let, let's keep this conversation going. Okay, that'd be great. But if it comes to the grand riding, you this time, you you this time invite me. Right. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> okay. All right. Goodbye, everyone.